Sir. Can I ask you a question, uh, Johnny, please? Uh, Johnny, um, when you were in a crew with uh, both officers and airmen, um, you probably very, very tightly knit crew, probably spent an awful, awful lot of time socialising together, as well as flying together. But I heard a story that after the raid, the officers had a big party in the officers' mess, but the senior NCOs didn't have a party for some reason. Is there any truth in that? Okay. The question is, um, uh, uh, first of all, the, the, the nature of NCO officer relationships within a crew. How, how close were you? And did that distinction matter? And then a specific point that after the raid, the uh, story about some of the officers going off to the bar, becoming separated from the, the, the NCO airmen who'd also taken part. And um, is that true? Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, Within the crew, and I speak now for my own crew, and for those who may not have heard, I flew with Joe McCarthy, who was the American in the Canadian Air Force. In that crew, we had three, four Canadians and three Englishmen. There was no distinction between the rank or anything else. Joe was Joe to the rest of the crew, and I, as a sergeant, treated him, and he treated me the same. But that was only within the crew. Outside of the crew work, the, re the rank was respected. As far as the uh, after raid parties were concerned, well, perhaps I might tell you first of all that in those days, believe it or not, I was a non-drinker. And so <laughs> I, 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 I didn't take part. And the reason I was a non-drinker was because I couldn't stand the smell of beer. It made me feel sick. So I didn't get into the bars at all, but yes, the parties were like, did go on, in, not only in the officers' mess, but in the sergeants' mess as well. And believe me, they had something to celebrate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Another, please. Yes, sir? Yeah, uh, Johnny, I'd just like to thank you for what you achieved in 6 and 7, and also in Bomber Command generally. Of course, you flew 50 missions with Bomber Command, didn't you? And I, I would just like to know, how did you go about that? How did you? Um, you've, well, he'd, I think he'd flown 50 trips before the dams raid. Um, and the question is, how did you do that? Uh, how did you keep going? How did you face it? <laughs> I could say easily, but um, perhaps that wouldn't be the right answer. No, um, I think the feeling the majority of the air crew, particularly the volunteers, was that they'd volunteered to do a job and they were going to do that job to the best of their ability. And whatever it took, so it went. They, they did it. In addition to that, I had such confidence in my pilot, subconscious constant, com, confidence, that I never thought I wasn't going to come back. He had that, created that confidence from the beginning and it was not only, not only his pilot ability, but his, his concern with the crew, any of the crew members' personal problems. He would be very concerned about that and help them all he could to overcome them. I had very good reason to yeah, have two opportunities of accepting that sort of grievance. Mm. OK, thank you. Yep. A um, uh, question for uh, Johnny again. Um, what was it like uh, practicing day after day and then going on the mission, constantly flying at low altitude compared to anything else that you'd ever done before? It was beautiful. <laughs> That's the easiest way to describe it. It was absolutely exhilarating. Having been, we had just finished our first tour on, on uh, 97 Squadron, which meant flying. 10, 15, had a push 20,000 feet. Always in the dark, because that was part of the safety of the, of the business, no, mo no moonlight flights in those days. Um, and seeing nothing until you got to the target and you saw all the guns that you'd got to go through when you got there. Um, then, when we got to 617, and we're told that we were, all, all flying would be low level, and the prescribed height was 100 feet. That was the pre prescribed height. 
Very few trips were done at that height. They were usually a bit lower than that, one way or the other. But lying in the front as a bomb aimer, just seeing that ground going whizzing past you underneath, it was absolutely exhilarating. And it was something which I think struck me personally as being the most exciting part of the whole thing. The low flying was the thing that really made it go. And it, it meant that um, other things that weren't quite so happy didn't make that much difference. The flying made up for it. And wasn't it a fact that apart from your squadron, everybody else was not allowed to fly solo? Oh, that was true, yes. And that, that of course, made it all so much the better. Perhaps, if, 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 perhaps I could just give you a couple of instances uh, of low flying during that, um, uh, that training period. One of our cross-country routes took us over the Spalding tulip fields. And at that height, as we went over there, the poor old tulips just went <laughs> straight over. <laughs> but knowing the Lincolnshire farmers as I do, losing crops like that would cost the Air Ministry, an awful lot of money because they would make their claims far bigger than what they would have got if they'd got their other thing. <laughs> the, other, the other thing was, in Lincolnshire, some of you may know, there's a place called Sutton Bridge, so-called because it has a bridge, road bridge going over the canal. But as you come up from the south, fly up from the south, the electric cables also go over the canal. And the practice was to fly under the cables and up over the bridge, which is great. It, it wasn't prescribed again, but it was great fun. And I talked recently to uh, someone who had a relative living in Sutton Bridge at that time, who could tell me that the whole of the population was scared stiff about all these low-level flying that were going over them. Sorry, that's just war. Yes. There's, there's a new publication emerging on Johnny Johnson's book of health and safety. <laughs> 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 Sir, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm interested to try and understand. You did 50 odd missions before the dams. What was the difference between surviving 50 missions and not? Apart from dark, what was it that made an experienced crew less likely to uh, to get shot down? If I could praise you, paraphrase the question, I think you tell me if I'm getting this right. That 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 that. that to what extent did, did a lot of experience count towards your survival? So if you've done 50 trips, were you more likely to, to be a survivor than if you'd done three or four? I think the survival rate, for the first, first tour was 30 operations. And the number of people that achieved that, compared with the number of uh, air crew members there were in Bomber Command, was remarkably small. And if you got through the first tour, you've done very well. But having gone as we did, uh, or, and were invited to join the uh, 617 as we finished our first tour, it was because it was a special trip. It was something different. And from then on, we became a, a special target squadron in, in that we were e equipped with a, a, a much better bomb site and so the accuracy was much better. And all those things were assets to the normal flying conditions. So as far as I was concerned, there was no time that I felt I'd had enough and I wanted to be grounded. It was only again through my skipper that I eventually left the crew because my wife was expecting our first child and Joe, Joe knew well quite well and he pulled me aside one day and said, Johnny, Gwyn must be worried stiff about whether this child's going to have a father or whether she's going to have a husband. You've got to give her a break. Pack it up now. And this is what I meant earlier when I said he was concerned about the crew's personal effects and did what he could to affect them. I had to leave the crew on that. He, he made me realize, and I must confess, that I hadn't really taken so much notice but he made me realise that I had other responsibilities besides flying in this war. Yeah. Yes, please. And then... Yep. Yep. Can I put this question to the good-looking lady on your right? You certainly can. I'd like to ask, can you bring to 
mind. Your father, after the raid, and how he was affected by the loss of the death. I can indeed, um, and never have I forgotten it, and always do I try to bring it before the public. Uh, he has been viewed, I know, in some circles and at some periods, as a man of war, just made weapons and, you know, never mind what happened. That's absolutely untrue. He did what he felt was his duty. He did what he felt would be the quickest way to, well, to bring the war to as speedy a close as possible. And when he realised how many lives had been lost, he was absolutely desolated. He never forgot that the rest of his life. When he got, finally got, uh, the Inventor's Award money, uh, he wouldn't take it because he said it was blood money. It was the blood of the men who went on the raid, and he wouldn't touch the money himself. He gave it all to an educational bursary at his old school. That's the effect it had on him. Thank you. Jerry, and then the gentleman there. Johnny, there is a story about Sutton Bridge where, was it Les Munro who was flying at a hundred feet and somebody came under him, or was it vice versa? Was it a story? Um, is this another legend? We're che checking out the story about uh, one aircraft at Sutton Bridge that um, was flying at about a hundred feet and another one flew underneath it. Is that apocryphal or...? I don't know about Sutton Bridge. But I can tell you of an incident when we were flying back from Wainfleet, which was bombing, bombing range, back to base. And we would be at a maximum of 60 feet, and another aircraft flew underneath us. <laughs> we knew, we knew because we saw the, the aircraft letters, that it was Les Monroe, the New Zealander. But he, he denied it. Until, <laughs> until he eventually mentioned Yes, perhaps it might have happened. <laughs> and, and ladies, you'll, the ladies present, I hope you'll excuse the language in this case, but a, a very good friend of mine was talking to me about this on, on one occasion <coughs> up at the uh, uh, HSI Aviation Gallery, and Les was there. And so we went over to Les and asked him about this particular incident, to which Les said, who, who told you that? He said, Johnny Johnson. He talks a lot of bullshit. Probably <laughs> 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 right. Yeah, please. Johnny, can I ask what method of bombing you use? Sure. Um, interesting question. The question is for the Zorpa, um, how, how were you, what method of bomb aiming were you using? By guess and by God. Is the question we can answer? No, the the uh, the, uh, the the action of the Zorba. One thing we hadn't been told was that there was a, a church steeple on the side of the hill from which we were supposed to be making our attack, and we were supposed to fly with the port outer engine along the, the dam itself, and estimate to drop the bomb as near as possible to the centre of the dam. We weren't spinning the bomb, it was an, an, an inert drop. It wasn't easy to get into that position correctly. And I learned, and I have to say, I learned very quickly how to become the most unpopular member of crew. Because every time I wasn't satisfied, I called dummy run. If Joe wasn't satisfied, he pulled away and left me to call dummy run. <laughs> and this resulted in voice from the rear turret of our crew comedian, in fact, Dave Roger, the rear gunner, after about the sixth or seventh dummy run, won't somebody get that bum out of here? <laughs> However, you, uh, nothing was said between Joe and myself, but I'm sure we both realised that the lower we got, the less forward travel that bomb was going to have before it hit the water. And what is more, the lower we got, the easier it would be to estimate the actual aiming point. On the tenth run, we were down to 30 feet, and we actually made the drop. And as soon as I said, bomb gone, thank Christ came from the rear turret. <laughs> <laughs> having done that, we, 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 
I, because we were so low, obviously it was nose up before we hit the hills on the other side. And I, I didn't see the explosion, but uh, D Dave did in the rear turret. And apart from his, his humor, he said the, the, he estimated the tower of water went up to about a thousand feet. And he said, what's war? In the downflow, some of it came into the turret. So I thought I was going to be drowned as well as knocked around by you lot. <laughs> when we circled the dam, we saw that we had in fact just crumbled the, 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 the top of it to a, a distance of about 20 yards. But, but uh, at this stage, perhaps I should say that Barnes Wallace, Barnes Wallace had told us at the briefing that in, in his estimation, it would take at least six bombs to, to, to crack that dam because of its construction. And he said, if you can crack it, the water pressure will do the rest, which wasn't surprising considering the amount of water there was in that dam. But unfortunately, we were the only, only one of the first five aircraft that were briefed to do that, and only one of the three reserves that were briefed managed to get there. So only two aircraft managed to attack it. Consequently, the, Zor the, the Sorpa wasn't even near breached. But got some later satisfaction by hearing that it had had to be drained so that they could repair the damage that had been done. Question from Mary. Uh, Dr. Ian Murray of my point recently, what, two years ago, published a book entitled The Bouncing Bomb Man. Uh, in fact, your father's work uh, on the bouncing bomb was, I think, about 3% of his work in life. What did he, other than the upkeep, what did he consider his greatest achievement? Um, I don't think I'll tell you what he said himself. <coughs> Well, perhaps I will have him say that. Oh, it's just having 20 grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was in part a joke. However, no, uh, I think he was extremely proud of the swallow, the swing wing, the variable geometry aerodyne, which, as he said, he sold to the Americans. Uh, and they spoiled his beautiful design by putting a tail on it. Um, but there we are. He certainly was proud of that. He was very proud of the R100 which was also a beautiful vessel. I think he, anything that was really beautifully designed, and those two were visually quite impressive. Uh, I mean, the, the bomb was splendid, but it's, it's, it's just a bit of an old barrel, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose he was very proud of bridging, uh, well, bridging out, actually, and designing the bridge from the Messina Bridge from Sicily to Italy, I really don't know, probably some little stars would have never got completed, and also the Parkes Telescope. And other things, he seems very proud of, like, for example, being made president of the Bath Institute of Medical Engineering, which not everybody knows, uh, because he um, designed lightweight calipers for, for children. He thought it was so distressing for children to have to lug around heavy mega ions, as you might say. That sort of thing. He was, he was actually very broadly based. Yeah. Mm. A couple more. Yes, madam. <coughs> Johnny, how did it feel being so young to be in such a huge, fantastic aeroplane that you flew? How did it feel? What was it like being very young and doing all this? Being be very young and enjoying it. <laughs> 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 I don't think things have changed much as far as that sort of age is concerned, apart from the fact that we, well, we did just as stupid things in a different sort of fashion. But um, um, it was the sort of thing, the reason I, I joined the war in the first, uh, joined the, yes, the, the, the Air Force in the first place, was because I felt I ought to get into this war. I, I hate to say that it was patriotic, I'm sure it wasn't. It was just a feeling of wanting to do something. And it took a long time to get there, in fact, because having joined the Air Force in November of 40, it wasn't until, I've got to be careful here, haven't I? Ju July of 42, that I was actually into 
the, the actual war part of it. Uh, but the actual getting there eventually was great fun, really was. Question for Mary. Um, Mary, your, your father was uh, very upset by the losses uh, on the raid. Um, did he equally, though, take any satisfaction of what he actually achieved, which is what he set out to achieve in such a short space of time? That is, that the dams were breached and chaos reigned after that. He was immensely grateful, in fact, although it's hard to credit this now, perhaps, to the good Lord for assistance and the blessed St. Joseph for carrying him. And this may sound a little ridiculous now, but it meant a lot to him. Yes, he was proud of what he'd achieved and what the men had achieved, but it was the men who achieved it, not him. They, they could not have achieved it without him. And if I may just add a little to that, my own personal feeling about Sir Barnes is that he was a wonderful man. And I understand he objected to the term of inventor being as fine as he was concerned. He was an engineer and a really brilliant engineer, electronic engineer. And that was his life. But as far as we were concerned, he did so much for the squadron as such, apart from his bouncing bomb. He subsequently produced the 12,000 pound tall boy, corkscrew bomb, which bored into the target before it exploded. And then, of course, the big one, the Grand Slam 22,000 pound bomb. The amusing thing about that, I think, is that each time he produced a bomb, the aircraft had been modified so that they could carry it. But they were really seemed to cope with that very well. <laughs> yes, please, please. Yes. Yeah, just to add to that, because it isn't very often underlined, and that is that the modifications of the Lancaster were entirely due to Roy Chadwick at Avro. Um, and um, Barnes knew that. Uh, he, he credited Chadwick with enormous cooperative uh, benefit. Uh, and it doesn't often get said. I mean, altering the Lancaster was no mean feat. Um, he did it uh, without bothering about, well, I don't know what the chaps at the top said, but uh, certainly didn't stop him doing it. And doing it quickly, too, what's more. So that the Lancasters for the raid were actually converted within about three weeks, I think. Now, that's not bad, because it was a big conversion. If you look under a Lancaster, one of the museums, you see these great enormous flats which weren't there in the first place. Um, and it's not often pointed out that without Chadwick, there would have been, well, no moonlight and no... We don't know, do we? No, no <laughs> carrying. <laughs> one more question, the lady there. Please. Go on, you can do it. <laughs> No. No, no. no, no. The, the, the R100 was the one that didn't crash. Yes, yes. Yeah. I will forgive you because my father would have done so. But the 101 crashed due to committee yeah, yeah, yeah. designing yeah, yeah. and no airworthiness certificate. Now, you will understand that, that Johnny has a, a long journey to make uh, before he rests his head. Uh, he's been up being helpful for, for uh, the stretch and uh, uh, being well into his 90s, um, I think we, sh we, should, we should draw, draw the line there. Um, um, I'm going to ask you, please, to thank both Mary and Johnny in the appropriate way. <laughs> University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.